And I talked to uh, somebody who was going to be online there this morning. Well, good morning, everybody. We will call the November 10th uh, Health and Human Services meeting to order. Um, first order of business is to approve the agenda. Just, I think the agenda is uh, is right, but we're just going to change the order in a couple items. So, all for motion. So move. Okay. That's that, Madam Clerk. First and second. All in favor, say aye. Aye. Oh yeah, that's. That you'll take a minute. Yeah. What's your name, Madam Clerk? Abby. Abby. Yep. Yeah. So you aren't from the clerk's office, though, are you? Nope. Oh, oh, okay. That's we got that approved. Approval of the minutes of the October third, thirteenth meeting. Any questions? Anybody have a copy or uh, call for a motion? I make a motion to approve the minutes. By Supervisor Kelly, call for a second. Second. And second by Supervisor Vincent. All in discussion. None. All in favor say aye. Aye. Carried unanimous. Number four, disclosure of committee members. I don't think there's any problem there. Um, public comments. Do we have anybody upstairs or any written? All of our, I want everybody to know that as long as I've been around every uh, committee meeting has been open to the public. We encourage public comments and uh, don't have anybody registered, Madam Clerk. Tanya. Okay, moving on to uh, number six, precept of information. I don't think there's any problem there. John. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, so I just want to address the committee, um, and it's on resolution 50-20. And I don't know if everyone's got the copies of the resolution after staff has signed it. I didn't get it, but um, one of the things that got brought up in our kind of general government executive committee meetings and and this, I'm going to kind of talk to all committees when a supervisor does sponsor a resolution and brings it to the board, that the committees, um, what we did is in general government, we've asked the committees and staff before a resolution gets forwarded to the board that there is a good discussion about what do, what do our resolutions when we draft these, what impact does it have to staff time? Um, you know, so currently, you know, with the COVID issue, this committee knows how overwhelmed staff is. Environmental services has had a backlog of uh, staff time. There, there was a month ago over 100 pending permits sitting there. So to keep this from going to general government or go to the county board and then back to committees, you know, what we're asking for is that that discussion is held at a committee level and that information is brought to the board before we actually vote on resolutions. The last moratorium we had, we, the county spent conservatively about fifty to $60,000 on staff time. <clears throat> and so before, and it was very overwhelming for staff, it was a year. And neither committee got anything done. It got done in executive committee and then it didn't pass at the county board, the original resolutions and the moratorium. So if it's gonna have a big impact to staff, um, and kind of using an example as the resolution for the recycling center right now, that's going back to committee again. And we asked staff to spend, we were kind of, we defined it to say, okay, staff, you've given us all these ideas over the last four or five years, you have one year now, but a time limit. In one year, can you come up with plans? So we've kind of said, hey, you got a year. We asked staff, is this a big impact? Staff says, no, it's just going to take some time to write some different ideas and plans, and we can do it during the process. So I'm just here to ask your committee to 
consider that issue because if it does have substantial staff time, it's going to get kicked back to general government or executive. So that's all I wanted to just. I'm going to apologize. Uh, I've, I've been working on, on the uh, bids and, and things like that. And uh, I, I'm not up to speed on the 1520 resolution. Well, that's okay. You guys are going to discuss it. I'm not here to support it or not support it. So we're, it it's not on our agenda it here. It is on our agenda. Number B. Yeah. Yeah, B I, B I, B I B see that, but the resolution is, where's the resolution still? Under 8 B. Yeah, under 8 B. So you guys are going to talk about it in committee today, and I just, this, all committees are going to start kind of having this piece of just understanding when we write resolutions. Sometimes we write feel good resolutions, supervisors write different resolutions for this or that. I've been working on every meeting with the Wisconsin County Association on the cable at the, at the state level. So I'll, I'll, and, and it's not necessarily this specific resolution, but it's the one on your agenda. But all committees need to take the impact of when we write resolutions. The well, that's the is, number one. You guys need to talk about. That, that's the number one part of it, really, is how much staff time is this going to take? And as a result of the staff time, are we getting our money's worth well, out of it? For example, the last resolution we had. It came and went and expired, and we really didn't get any anything, you know. To pay John, for example, on. like the Stour Trail, the committee environmental services, I believe, and uh, uh, they brought it to the county board, and we funded an outside uh, experts to help us develop the plan. Um, you know, we're we're we're. Environmental Services County Board just funded money for a tag committee for the trail advisory group instead of just kind of putting it all on staff. And this resolution kind of says administrator and staff need to work on this. And I just want to make sure that if you guys discuss it, that somehow you address that so it doesn't, you guys go down the road with thinking, hey, we're doing this, we're doing this, because the question's going to get posed back to general government executive if it's determined. And Chad, when he signed at Roberts, and I don't have the signed one here, he made a note. Huh? You saw it? It's just signed now. What's that? It's signed now. I got it signed. Chad. Chad Roberts. Oh, I thought you meant the. So on the copy I saw with Chad Roberts, we had the meeting with Administrator Netherland on resolutions. He, he wrote a comment in there about they need a certain amount of time to do a staff evaluation of what the impact of this resolution, once you guys shake it out, what the impact this would be to staff time. So this is kind of a, and I don't know if Chad's on the meeting today, probably. Chad not. on the, he yeah, should, yes. He should Chad, be. I, I address it when you guys get to that as the agenda item. Well, thanks for your comments and we'll consider the whole yep. ramifications of what we're doing. Yep, thank you. I, I, I appreciate that. Uh, Number eight, Tanya, do we want to move on to uh, your comments there? Yeah, do you want to put my PowerPoint up? This is a COVID update for you guys. Um, let me get that right here. Okay, so just go ahead to the next screen. Um, so I just wanted to give you guys some numbers on what we're seeing as far as the increase in cases in the county. And I also have some comparable counties, our surrounding counties, so we can get a better picture of what's happening in our area. Um, first is our Polk County case increase. So if you, if you can see, can everybody see that, first of all? No, can you make it larger, Kathy? Um, I can talk you through it too, because I'm not sure how to okay. I'll zoom in. Okay, is that better? Yes. Yeah. Hold on. All right, hold on. Back to us. Yep. Sorry. Okay. Okay. Thank you. 
just do the zoom in with our email. Yeah, I, I got it. Um, and we'll just go from so from right around the beginning of school, we were managing. This is a two week snapshot that the state gives us number of cases coming in the door. So right around 25, 38, next two weeks is 39. So this is a rolling total um, every two weeks that we get. It's updated every Wednesday at four o'clock now from the state. Um, see that's 70 and then we're starting to jump a little bit higher, 109, 146. 199 and now the last two week period was the bigger jump uh, up to 282 and that's cases in Polk County positive cases in Polk County. Um, next week we're on track to be higher than the 282 um, that percentage increase so. So you're aware of what have the um, number of people that have been getting tested gone? Has that gone up too? I think the numbers are going up as far as who's getting tested we've had the. National Guard here doing testing. Okay. Um, last week they were here, they tested 258, I think, or something like that, close to that. Um, and the last time they were here two weeks prior, they did 100 tests. Um, so it's, it's out and about that um, people can get tested there, along with going to their clinics. Are um, we still have three deaths in the county? Uh, we just released yesterday, there's been five deaths. We had two over the weekend. Okay, next. Next is Barron County. That's our neighbor um, to the east here. Same thing, they kind of plugged along. Um, I think their big jump was when they had the, I think it was the bean factory in Poland. Um, a lot of positives out of that one. And now a very significant, I don't know what's happening there now, but they jumped from 447 to 626 over the last two weeks. Okay, next one. Okay, Burnett County, um, they had their big surge back uh, mid September, and they've just kind of been plugging along with, um, you know, 45 to 70, 80 cases every two weeks. Which is, I mean, that's a lot. They have a health department of about two staff up in Burnett. So I know they're they're struggling too. We don't have any stats on St. Croix County, can you? That's next. Oh, thank <laughs> you. Okay, St. Croix County. Um, so they're also experiencing the high numbers. St. Croix County is um, the same, or twice as big <coughs> as both Barron and Polk County. So they may have a little more resource to be able to um, manage these cases, but on a call yesterday, they had 180 positives sitting in their queue waiting to be assigned because they just couldn't get to them. Um, so it's the increases everywhere. This is, um, if you don't get dizzy from looking at this, <laughs> it just kind of shows the percent increase for all four counties. Um, it might be a little misleading. None of the counties have experienced any decrease in the number of cases coming in. It's just a percent increase every two weeks. Um, so we're seeing bigger jumps in our increases every two weeks with um, the numbers coming in. <coughs> and then the next slide. Um, this for Polk County only, you know, we just, I think there was one week we only had a 5% increase. But otherwise, now we're seeing last week was 42% increase. So when you're increasing by that volume, it's, I would say we probably have between 70 and 100 cases coming in the door every day. Okay, next. Um, this is a little, just, I want you to just look at the map. The map on the left is case activity when school started. So you see a lot of color on there. That means there was a lot of variation in the state as far as rate of rate of case activity. The, the map on the left is as of November 3rd. Everybody is in the, the dark color on the right. On the right. Um, and they've even added a very high category. We used to just have the high category. Now we have very high category. Entire state is in that very high category. So what when we look at the, the two-week trajectory, 
our burden back when school started was 56.9. That meant we had about 25 cases during that two weeks. The map on the right shows the last two weeks. Our um, number of cases was 278 during that two week. On track now, it'll come out tomorrow at four, we'll be even higher than that based on what we know from local data. Next. Um, this is a, we track of all of the schools in the area, um, the number of cases in the schools, how many are isolated, and remember that means the number isolated is positive case, and then the quarantine are those close contacts around that isolated case. Um, what school building they're in, um, the building isolations, building quarantines, and our number of new cases since 1026. So we're seeing a pretty significant increase in the number of cases in schools, school quarantines. Um, so go to the next one, Kathy. So the notes that I'm um, just jotting down kind of our day-to-day -day here, um, it's community spread. We're not able to track and, and find back to the origin of where they've got it. Um, we get a lot of public refusing disease investigations, um, and that's very hard for us because in order to be able to stop the progression of it and the spread of it, we need to be able to quarantine people so they stay home. People are flat out refusing, hanging up on us, um, just not participating. And so it just makes it almost impossible to get a handle on it. We have moved, um, we've considered our prioritizing of positive cases. Um, our, some of the age groups that are the refusers are more of the um, ones that we would just send a letter to and say, you, you have a positive case, here's what you need to do. Um, instead of hanging up on us, you can read the letter and call us if you have questions. Um, <laughs> and really focusing on our older population, school population, congregate type of settings, um, because those are our most vulnerable populations. One of our other issues is the lag time between the health department receiving positive cases because the labs are overwhelmed. It could be two to three to four or five days before we get notification that there's a positive case. Usually the public knows before we know, and they're calling us to say, I'm positive. Um, so we have to do a lot of um, backtracking to try to, you know, figure out if they truly are positive and what all that. And then we're with the response. Um, we are changing our staffing currently. Just recently, we had to move to a seven-day-a-week operation. They're working holidays. They're working ten-hour days, so we can try to balance and get them breaks. Um, our process changes just about every day based on what's coming in the door. Um, so it's confusing. We have a lot of new workers limited term workers who are in training periods. Um, so it's just very stressful times right now um, trying to respond to this pandemic. Um, schools are going to virtual learning. We know that Unity is starting tomorrow. Clear Lake started on Monday. Osceola has started. St. Croix Falls is in the middle of theirs. And I think there's more considering and coming. And we're starting Friday is their last day, then they're going virtual. Okay. Well, Osceola has the middle school, high school closed on Monday, mm -hmm. but the elementary school is still open. Yep. So they must not have very many cases in the elementary because they can separate by building. So that's why they're doing that. You want to finish, Tanya, and then we'll take questions. When I we think get I might, this might be the last one. Yep, that's it. Thanks for that update. Not anything yeah. encouraging right now. Uh, everybody needs to be careful. The additional deaths that we had now, are they elderly or had some correspondence with jobs in the city, out of state, or anything? They were both older individuals from the area. But I wanted to thank Tanya and her staff in that because. Uh, they had a meal site in Milltown that they had to close down because of the positive, and they went to what is that the school that did the meals and that, and then they delivered them, and then some people put them together so that they get back out to the people. So, and that was all done on the weekend. 
So there's a lot of activity on the weekend. Um, when the schools calls with, with a positive, we are jumping on those because we need to notice those parents that they their kids can't come to school on Monday. So between the superintendents, the nurses, and the health department, it can take your whole Sunday to um, figure out what kids need to stay out of school. Of the testing that you do here, you don't do the analysis here, you send them to where? So all of, we don't do any testing at the health department. All of the testing is done by hospitals, clinics, National Guard, other sites. That has to be um, sent to a qualified lab to do the reading of the test, and then they send it back to us. Actually, most of the testing that is done in Polk County is sent out of for the analysis. Most of it is. I think hospitals have very limited capability to test, um, like for procedures before they're going in. They can test right on site, but that's very limited. So it's um, Burnett Medical, I think, does rapid testing. Um, and we're seeing some of those rapid tests come through now where you find out the same day. And it's an actual PCR test, like a real thing, not an antigen test. Some investigating rapid testing. I don't remember the case. They can have a result of an hour. Mm -hmm. We have to follow up with the full nasal swab yeah, like PCR test. To confirm it. Uh, John, I have a quick question. Um, and I would echo what Joe said. I mean, holy buckets. This is hot and heavy, and I appreciate the work that you do. And I've been, I periodically listen to the press conferences in Minnesota, and I know that we have the same sort of urgency and numbers relative to our capacity. So it's, it's. I mean, thank you for, for that. And I had a quick question or a comment. I think us supervisors, we really need to wear our mask because we we're in a leadership position. We need to show the public this is going to be a long winter if we don't really double down on being careful and attentive and taking care of our community. So I think we really need to do that. And then the last question I had: How are we? How is our staff holding up? How many staff do we have out? Yeah, out with yeah, being that have isolated. Yeah. Um, there's actually not too many right now on Polk County um, employees. So okay, I don't good. know that I don't have an exact number no, for just, you. I'm glad to hear that. Okay. But we are we do um, distancing in the buildings, we're sanitizing, we wear the masks, and people think because they wear the mask they don't have to quarantine. It's the only thing the mask is doing is protecting um, you from potentially getting it. If you wear the mask, that's great. We want you to. Um, but it doesn't keep you out of quarantine. And the other big rumor that we hear is that they can test out of quarantine. So if I'm quarantined and I go and get a negative test result, then can I be off quarantine? Not the case because you have to, um, the disease still could be incubating in your in your body. I should say the virus should be still incubating in your body. Um, and we've seen some on day 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. So that's why they're asking for the 14 day Oh, hey, Tanya, can you hear me? Yep. Um, this is Sabrina. So I just wanted to add to that as well. Um, so I live and breathe COVID every day in the clinic, and it's it's becoming completely overwhelming on the hospital systems. I mean, we've lost so many nurses and providers to this that we don't know what we're going to do in terms of staffing. Um, I can tell you that the calls I listen to every morning, there's two ICU beds available in the whole western part of the state right now. Um, Minnesota has less than 2% of ICU beds available right now um, because they're so inundated with COVID patients. Um, you can barely get a med surge bed. We're having to transfer patients um, even out of the Eau Claire area from this area because we can't find a bed for them. And that's not just necessarily a COVID patient, but for example, we had a patient come in um, with a STEMI or a heart attack and we had to sit on that patient for over hours because we had no place to transfer them to. Um, to the cath lab because the beds were so full in the cities, in Eau Claire, in the northern part of the state. We just have no beds. There many of the hospitals are on divert. Um, and so it's serious and it's a big problem right now for um, our hospital capacity. Yep, and there is that alternate care facility open in Milwaukee, um, but also hard to transfer patients down to Milwaukee, but they are looking at needing to do that if they can't find a 
place around here. Right, and a lot of these people are taking up our ICU beds and those people can't be transferred to Milwaukee because Milwaukee's the more the baseline care, not the ICU type of care. So yep. um, the ICU bed is kind of the, the big issue here. Um, you know, having two beds available in the entire Western part of the state, I mean, that's an issue. Um, not just for people that have to be in the ICU for COVID, but also people that are having heart attacks and strokes and car accidents and traumas. I mean, there's no beds available for these people. And um, so that is just a huge, huge issue right now. I didn't get the identification on that lady. That's Sabrina. Oh, okay, in our department. Um, she's our nurse practitioner board member. Uh, Vince, did you want to make a comment? You are on the regular agenda as for uh, an update here. So we we actually moved into the COVID update. Do you want to address something on A and a number eight? Um, I would say that uh, we are, as we continue to monitor this, we are updating our internal policies here. Uh, we are uh, starting tomorrow, sending more people remotely working. Uh, we are obviously, as Tanya said, keeping up our and maintaining our cleaning and those types of the message tonight at the board meeting uh, in my administrator's report will kind of echo what Tanya is saying, and that is the urgency for individuals to take more responsibility and, and do what they can to ensure they are staying safe and that they're not spreading. This is not something that the government can fix, but rather as individuals, we're going to have to step up, wear the mask, do the social distancing, use good judgment when it comes to uh, going to uh, public areas or places where people are congregating. Use your sense. Don't, don't, uh, don't think it's not there because as you can tell by the numbers, it's everywhere. So I look forward to your uh, update. I'm sure you'll have some cost figures and other things on the board meeting tonight. I just want to show you the dashboard. Um, I always like to have people take a look at this right on the county's homepage, um, and that will give you the most up-to-date information. Um, Kathy, can you click on the Wisconsin DHS activity in that very high category on the bottom, that tab? Up, over, up, top. Oh, I guess, sorry. And the disease activity tab. Okay, now go to the bottom left. Those are the maps I showed you. Those get updated um, every Wednesday at four o'clock. So that's a very um, good graphic, I think. And looking at the burden, uh, that's statewide. Over 1,060 burden is considered crisis level. Um, that'll get updated again tomorrow <laughs> at four. So just so you guys know, if you want a up-to-date snapshot of what's going on, that's a really good link. And we're always available. If you have questions, need anything explained, you can call us. Sure. Question. Tanya, is there any place in this area where they can make like a gym or National Guard Armory or something like that into a place for beds and stuff? Um, early on, I think we looked at the need to have isolation facilities to keep our healthcare staff um, healthy or our jail staff or our critical mm -hmm. staff healthy. We explored a couple of places, um, looked at, at a place in Barron County with Barron County, but it, we don't have anything set up at this point. But is that a possibility? I mean, I think we could we could look at um, what, what, what buildings are vacant right now in the county and but are you asking about hospital beds? Right. Oh, um, nothing in the works that I know of in this area for alternate care facilities. I think in addition to the hospital bed, it's the staff shortage. Like, I we've had, I don't know, six or seven nurses out in the past three days, like all positive for COVID. So I think a, a bigger part of the issue is um, the staff shortage because they're obtaining 
you know, the virus from their kids coming home from school or, you know, the going out in public or whatever it may be. But um, we have a major staff shortage and uh, we could take more patients if we had the staff to do it, but we just don't have staff. And so when they get to that point at the hospital level, they go into crisis staffing where we have to make adjustments to how they can come back while they're on quarantine, if there are no, no symptoms, testing negative, temping, full PPE. I mean, it's pretty, pretty detailed on how they can work if they're on quarantine, if they have that level of shortage and have to provide the health care. Same within the nursing homes. Vincent, Tanya, as far as you know, we don't have any uh, positive cases at Golden Age Manor. Um, I think they've had some positives there. We actually have uh, that are in isolation. And they are. They have a COVID wing. I'm not sure if you can answer this or not, Tanya, but I um, see that Barron County has had about a dozen deaths or more in the past week. Is that like a nursing home situation? Or, I mean, it's kind of shocking to me. They had like seven deaths in one day and they had like five deaths in a day. I, I, I guess I'm wondering if that's like in nursing homes or in what can, is there anything we can do to make sure that things like that don't happen here? We're doing everything we can and like you said, personal responsibility, but I, I just would hate to see that. I believe, didn't you state that the largest uh, positive cases was at the Seneca mechanic facility with my- That was earlier, that was earlier, earlier this year. Earlier. I don't know what is happening now in Barron County where where so I can speak to Barron County. Um, Seneca happened earlier. We don't have an issue with Seneca at all right now. Um, currently in Barron County, a lot of the positive cases are coming from the school districts. Honestly, Rice Lake is a huge area, um, as well as inundating from um, some of the local factories. But really, there's not one specific factory that's blowing up like Seneca that's causing all these positive cases. It's simply community spread. People aren't wearing their mask. People aren't isolating. People aren't quarantining. And then I can also speak to the deaths that, yes, that is mostly long-term care facility um, between ages 70 to 90 currently in Barron County. Thanks, Sabrina, very much for your. If you your follow their Facebook page, they put um, good information on Barron County Facebook page, Health Department. Hopefully, we've covered and had the warning on this. So, if there's any other questions on that, let's move on to the uh, resolution 5020. Sure. For... There's a comment. It's, it's from uh, G. Thorman. It would be nice to report confirmed cases per capita for Polk County. The chance of getting COVID is about 2.5%. The chance of dying is confirmed to less than half of 1% in Polk County. That does show per capita on here. Yeah, it does. <clears throat> so, uh, resolution 5020, uh, open for discussion. Tanya, do you want to lead that? Or? Um, I, I think the 5020 has been floating around for a couple of months. Ms. Middleton may want to address it, I think, and explain what it is yeah. you're trying to accomplish. So this is the resolution that we talked about in July. And we had sort of the, what were we calling it, Tanya? The we knows. The, we, the formerly known as. Yeah, the formerly we known as we knows. Uh, motion that we talked about where we basically had these points and the and the concept at the time was to make sure that public health components of a CAFO discussion were incorporated. So in the same way that we incorporate, uh, you know, ag issues, environmental issues, water issues, we wanted to make sure the public health piece was a key component of that. The so National Association of Public Health has come out with uh, study in 19 really looking at CAFOs and the health components of that and we cite that in here so I think that's an uh, important thing for us to keep in mind as we're moving forward into operational ordinances. This has taken so long to get to this point that maybe we want to tweak it a little bit. Um, you know we talked about this in July, we passed the motion, we asked Tiny to turn it into a resolution and send it to the board. But apparently we needed to have that come back to us with a signature of which I just did that this morning and have us, we already said unanimously at the time, send it on, but now it's sort of a paperwork thing. 
Um, and then to look at the staffing piece. I don't know exactly, this is sort of a new curveball on this, and um, I think it's a little bit um, difficult for us to understand as a committee what a staffing implication might be before. I mean, it's sort of like saying, oh, you got to have everything figured out before you could even move forward with the resolution, as opposed to us as committee members, we're supposed to be sort of setting the setting the tone and tenor and vision of what we want to do. We want to protect public health. We want to protect the environment. And um, we think public health is a key component. Now, the impact on staffing, I don't think we we should be meddling that or would even know. I mean, do you guys have some thoughts on that? So I, I think the staffing piece is, is a little bit hard, and I don't think that changes what we're saying in here, and it isn't changing what we've said we wanted to do. Um, I think the staffing piece is do it. We need to move forward and how that gets figured out. I mean, I hear you on the cost piece, but we can't, that's not anything that we would have access to knowing. Speaking on behalf of the staff, I, I, I think my question is, I, I can't, I don't know what this is asking us to do. Uh, if I look at draft and develop legislation that addresses the above stated negative impacts of CAFO, one, I don't see any above negative impacts. Secondly, and I, I like the idea of considering health in legislation, and we've already, I think, done that. Since July, we've passed the CUP, and in addition to that, now we've drafted the operational portion. So I, I, I kind of read this and thought, oh, well, I think we've already done what this resolution is asking. And so then my question is, is, a, is it a MOOC resolution? Or is there something else that we want to get out of this? I've got a comment on uh, uh, this week and even this morning. I got a couple calls from uh, some of our, our larger dairies that, that are actually capable. We have five capos, uh that are grandfathered in our county. And we have a lot more dairies that are with, you know, over those 500 animal units. Uh, we've heard a lot of these have been done before some of you new supervisors came on board. Uh, most of our public comments at Unity High School. And uh, we don't want to generalize. This is what I was cautioned on by the by the people that called me. They were, they were uh, dairy farmers or CAFOs. And we've got to be very careful. Uh, it started out with the swine, and uh, we had that in place. But we've got to be very careful that we protect our, our, our dairy farmers. Here, our small farmers are gone. When I was farming, I was actually over the 500 uh, uh, CAFO uh, units. And uh, these dairy farmers, they're the ones that feed the world. And I think if you heard Jeff Jackson, Staff has brought him in. He's been here twice. He told him, he's uh, told us about the permits that he issues. I think he covers everything pretty, pretty discreetly. And uh, we've had uh, Ron Barr from the Wisconsin Counties Association. Just last Thursday, I was under, uh, I, I was in touch with uh, on the steering committee of all 72 counties, and. Uh, our legislature uh, will be having some new people in the, in the legislature. Tonight, I'll have at the county board the updates on the number of senators and uh, uh, congressmen that are uh, assemblymen that in our state legislature that will be making up that, that body. And uh, the Wisconsin counties is lobbying. They're the main lobbyists to the legislature. The legislature really looks for the information from the county's association because we make up the whole 72 counties while a particular legislature just represents his district. So they look for this type of information. And uh, yeah, it is still a process and what you're doing is really contributing to this process. Um, like Bill says, uh, 
far as enacting that 50-20, uh, I'm hoping that we can just keep on studying this, keep on contributing anything that you people can, I mean, you should probably, I should probably get together with you some, if there's anything from you that I can contribute to the Wisconsin County Steering Committee, and that's why I, I told you I left in a hurry this morning, I had some other engagements, so, but I'll bring you some more information tonight that I can come back to you. I had a couple of questions about 5020, because he knew on the board, um, when you mentioned health and all policy, so I started researching health and all policy. The only thing I can find on it is from the December 11th, 2018 Health and Human Services meeting, where there was um, a motion uh, made by Tony Oliva and um, seconded by uh, Dr. Lagas to forward the ordinance onto the county board. But then there was some discussion and then there was a motion to amend it, and the amendment said uh, Community Services Division at that time to develop and implement the initiative of health and all policies in its decisions and develop policies and not send it to the county board at this time. And that was passed. That was all passed. So as far as I can tell, there is no health and all policy that's ever been passed at the county board level. And I've got the copy of the health that the web was presented at that December 18th, 20 or December 11th, 2018 meeting. So I don't know that we have that in place to reference in a resolution. Brandy, do you have a comment? Brandy, do you have a comment? Yeah, I, you know, I just think that if we could depend on everybody to be a good an operator at the existing you know, capos and our dairy capos and everybody that we have, we can do things like this. But I think, unfortunately, we can't depend on everybody to be a good neighbor and to be a good operator. And that's why there's a need to protect public health. I view this resolution as really um, kind of as taking up the mantle of the American Public Health Association and the National Association of County and City Health Officials. And that we are agreeing with with uh, their their intentions to protect public health, and as a county, we are um, picking up their mantle. That's how I view it. Well, I have, I have concerns on, about both of those organizations being listed in this resolution because I, I've I've been on their websites and read about them. I didn't know anything about them, and the uh, American Public Health Association. They have a, a, a space on their website where they list items of note. Well, in 2014, their item of, item of note was that they surpassed 300,000 Twitter followers. Then they have nothing of note to list in the past six years. So I don't know what, you know, they've, when they originally started in the 1890s, it sounded that they were addressing real health issues. And then they move to really where they're supporting more progressive type initiatives now. They're, so it's it's a, and they're, they're in DC. It's a, like a, you know, they they influence our, our government officials. That's what they're about, influencing government officials. And the same with the National Association of County and City Officials. Their, their purpose is population health and they're headquartered in DC. They're a 501c3, so they're a nonprofit, but they, provide access to marketing and branding materials that will help raise visibility and perceived value of governmental public health. And some of that's good, but we need to realize that they're lobbyists really is what they're doing. They're lobbying government officials for to support what they're promoting. Now, I don't know enough about them to know what they're promoting. I just get concerned when we you know, we're quoting something they've got, they made a statement in 2019. Okay, the other one made a statement in 2018. I, I think what we've put together already in the county is we're saying we want, we want to address the environment here in our county when it comes to cables. We want to address health issues. I don't know what, 
I don't understand the purpose of this based on all the other things that we have going on. I mean, what, what do we get out of this? I think, we, you know, what we don't need is duplication. We need to really be serious about our initial platform on these on these issues. Uh, and, but I, I think we've got everything pretty well uh, brought to the table. And, I got a question. I also have received calls and stuff, and they're saying, you know, that this is going to be putting more regulations on them. They've already got the, the government regulations. They've got the town regulation, townships. They've got the county regulations. They've got the DNR. And they're, they're all saying, what more can we handle? And the whole thing comes from this odd careful thing. And I don't know how the rest of you feel about this, but... To me, we have not heard a single thing in the last, what, four months, five, six months? DNR said here a while back that they have not even come to them for any permits. So I think it's a done, gone deal. That's my opinion. But well, these other guys are saying, we do not need more regulations. Are you referring to the uh, application in Burnett County? Yeah, no, there was an there was an application taken out in Burnett County, and uh, that is the only one. It, I addressed that with the Wisconsin County, and that is the only one that was even an application <clears throat> taken out. And they feel that uh, once they looked at everything that's uh, already regulated in the state of Wisconsin, they don't they don't think there's ever going to be anything in that. But we still have the platform there, and uh, it. I, I would like to see this, yeah, being on the agenda of the uh, Environmental Services Committee and share everything with them. I don't see the calls I got. Same as you, echoing what you said, Joe, and even this morning, you said, "Please protect us on our on, on our uh, regulations that we don't have any more." Because all we can have. I mean, we have a proposal. Um, so I think the it, the calls you're getting about the CAFO issue is probably more going to be a related to the operation ordinance. Um, I think that's and not this. What I will do with this resolution is withdraw it, kind of look at it. This this really was written at a different time. <laughs> it almost it was written early spring, or you know, like whatever, I mean, May, June, when it wasn't really clear to me that public health was a priority. I think now with having the operation ordinance in our committee gives us that opportunity. Um, however, I will look at this. I, I don't agree with the public health piece association. I think they have their, the report that they have is really good and I can get that link to you. Um, I have it. I have it right here. I, I think there's really good, important information that they can provide this committee. And I don't know, we could get someone to come talk to us or something like that. But I do think that this resolution was really trying to get at something that is the public health piece of a CAFO discussion is the third leg of a stool. And so um, I understand the, the resolution. I agree. It's, it's dated, I think, at this point. I'll withdraw it. I'll bring something else back if I feel like. We want to do that, but um, the the public and I want the minutes to reflect this important piece that, that the public health has to be the third leg or the first leg of a three leg stool. And so that was written at a time before that. Um, and having public health assessment, I mean public health association reports, looking at all that stuff is going to be absolutely critical as we move into the uh, the operation ordinance. That's not going to Make your phone calls go away. <laughs> can, can't that be part of the finding of facts and right. and yeah and that yep. piece? Yep. Instead of I mean, there, it makes sense to me to have it included in something like that. But this, I, I struggled with this. Yeah. And maybe well, the both of you have brought up some really good information and, and some good points. Mm -hmm. and certainly appreciate the research that you've got. And it brought some really things to the table, and, and we need to keep on working with the environmental committee and, and 
instead of just leaving things set on, I like to see them where services listed here. Bob or Bill, did you have anything that you could add on this or any comments? I just want to make sure that, that we touch with everybody. I know. The only question that I had, John, was um, when Chairman Nelson had come in and, and uh, talked a little bit about that uh, amended Polk County public nuisance, I'm just reading it off the sheet here, public nuisance and human health hazard ordinance. Does that have anything to do with the all-encompassing health policy? Uh, because I, I, I took my notes on here, indicated that they were going to combine several departments and individuals uh, from various policies and to rewrite it into this major rewrite for that ordinance. And that would have been number 30-20. So is there any correlation between the between this coming under a human health hazard um, and the CAFO information? Because it's not listed specifically in here, talking about a CAFO in here, but it talks about lots of other things about uh, emission odors, uh, polluted waste areas, that type of thing. So is that an all-encompassing health policy? Uh, so spillage and that other stuff is already covered in human health hazard ordinance. So we would already be investigating. Okay. The rewrite of the public nuisance slash human health hazard is kind of a separate track that I believe you had asked us to look at. It wasn't was our business. committee yeah. charged with uh, addressing and possibly coming up with a county uh, being the lead in a county nuisance ordinance. Right. We are we are looking at uh, the process of putting together a an improved and updated nuisance ordinance. Um, and we are I guess the next step is we're putting together a committee of people because a nuisance ordinance involves uh, community Services Division, Environmental Services oh, Division, it's huge. Yeah. and and what we're trying to do, just so you know, if, if you're looking for an all-encompassing one policy fits all, it's not going to be that because I think this is the nuisance ordinance is something that we're probably going to have to to get a feel from the, the board. What is it you want to target, and we're going to try to make it as specific as possible. That's another major item that's been addressed. Wisconsin County. It's just about anything you do with a nuisance ordinance. When it comes to our court system, it's an infringement on their on their rights. You know, of one of our constitutional rights and their statutes. And, and you get in court, and it's you. That that's a big challenge for us. It parallels something like this. And Right now, with our COVID and everything, uh, that's our main concern. That's every one of us personally. But uh, certainly, if, if you do a withdrawal there, uh, make sure that we you're free to bring something up at each meeting. And, you know. I just answer this question. The, the health and all policy piece, what, that's actually a term sort of for a matrix that the health department has. That you would walk through that. Right. That's what I was referring to. Okay. And it's not under the ordinance. Okay. So you're yeah. Thank you. And we, if we, have we pretty much got this covered with uh, your withdrawal, Sure. Uh, Chairman Nelson. Yeah. So I think, uh, Mr. Leva, the idea was was that this nuisance ordinance would go through the building here and hit all the departments. But I certainly think that, again, is an ordinance or a resolution that um, you know, it impacts staff, it impacts everybody. So I don't know why it wouldn't come back here. And that there's where you use that matrix like you're talking about to review it, that if there are things you should add. Well, uh, you know, the reason I, I say that, uh, Chris, is that you did a good job in explaining it when you came the first time. Yeah. And I certainly support that. The only question that I brought up was um, when you have the different types of, of uh, ordinances that we've looked at here or resolutions that we've looked at here that deal with the CAFOs, and I, do, I don't want people to become confused that they're all encompassing into one ordinance. 
Oh, gotcha. These are into one resolution. They're separated. Almost. Yes, they are. That was my point. Yes. And I didn't want I didn't gotcha. want that to be confusing yeah. because when we talk about all encompassing into one policy, that's not true. I know that there isn't one there. Right. But to separate those out and to have clarification, I appreciate that. Thank you. Well, that's a good point. The, the title is misleading. You think, Correct. Oh, everything is under there. Yeah, it's not there. Then yeah. it, when you say umbrella, that it doesn't come under there. Okay. We're actually pretty fortunate here yet. If, if you're on a town board or a municipality, you have somebody coming every little while. Well, my neighbor's got this, and we got to do something about that. And well, the reason I bring that up is in a discussion that I've listened to here, when you come to the different types of resolutions, there is a difference between the cities, the towns, the townships, and the county. Because everybody has their different little policies right that they there. put in. And you're right, John, because when people come to the township board or they come to the city council, there's different ordinances. And they and get very get, vociferous. And trying to get those in is like trying to squeeze jello because it's not going to happen. <laughs> and I can tell you from our health office there, you know, and, and I think every municipality and every uh, government. They have something, a neighbor has something to complain oh, about right. something. But the only time that I've ever seen anything that legally could be done is when our county health officer is called out there and there's there's rats or, or uh, then he can do something and then he can, can have it. And he's pretty well covered by, by the legal situation. Otherwise, Never seen anything where there was any legal. That's a little bit another area. Uh, Vince, then do you want to cover C, D, and E? Uh, I think those are next on our agenda. Well, I would like Bob to address. We've, we've asked questions around groundwater testing. So Bob, I think, has some information. I just asked him, Do you have any other comments? Um, in regards to Resolution 5020. No, we're not done with them. Moving on to uh, groundwater. Yeah, yeah, I can talk. Do you have any comments there? Yes, sir. Sure, go ahead. Can I just interrupt? Yeah, one go second? ahead, Bill. Um, uh, Mr. Gentleman, do you need, is just Robert's rules of order here, if she withdrew her that resolution, does that need to have a motion on the floor for her to withdraw that? I don't think so. There's, I don't, the lay is on there. I think. I think if it's recorded in a minute, and Madam Secretary, do you have that recorded? Yeah. Okay, so that's good enough for her just to withdraw yeah. her yeah. resolution? Yeah. Okay, we'll, thank we'll you. We'll move on to season. Thank you. Well, um, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Um, you know, in some ways, HD is related to HD. It is. That's really what I asked for the comments together. Right. Um, well, I guess I'll just uh, jump into 8C, which is uh, ground testing work plans and grant funding options. Um, if you'll recall, um, as recently as last meeting, the previous meeting, we had Doc Lawson here, Eric Wojcik, uh, presenting the results from last year's groundwater study where we measured. Um, several wells in the Balsam Lake watershed. And we did that through a subsidy from the Public Health Department. Um, the last time we've done a countywide groundwater study was in 1996. So going back to that resolution 5020, there is a whereas, that last whereas, which is just, I'm just curious because it talks about our groundwater data being antiquated. There's some, so there, that's true. Um, but I, again, um, last time we did a countywide groundwater test was in 1996. 90 what? 1996. It is our data. Uh, last year, again, we, uh, we measured the Balsam Lake, Balsam Lake watershed. Um, had pretty good participation. What we did is we sent out a letter to all those residents with well water in Balsam Lake Watershed, um, inviting them to take part in sampling their water, in which you paid for it was a free analysis. Um, but it's under over 30% of the folks we contacted participated. Um, 
And so, in that sense, this watershed, watershed we're standing on right now, we do have some qualitative and quantitative data about um, nitrogen levels, pathogens, etc. Um, and then I recall from the last meeting, you all had asked about what are other counties we have. And currently, believe it or not, St. Croix County, our neighbor here, is in the middle of a five year drought on One of two in the state. That has gotten a grant. Yeah, and Don is another one in Bayfield, as you probably noticed in WCA, they're they're starting one as well. Correct. Right. The two grants issued are mm -hmm. done in yeah. So St. Croix County is conducting a countywide one. Um, both the St. Croix County and Dunn County one are nearly 100 percent funded by the lab. By what? Eleven. So okay. we did a grant search. Um, Line of Water Department reached out to our colleagues, particularly those counties who are conducting those groundwater studies. And yes, there are several small grants we can cobble together to subsidize, but the primary overall cost is really a revenue expenditure. Uh, there's there's a lot of lake associations. Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, apply for grants, yeah. and there's another round of yeah. uh, smaller lake grants that they grants. do. And our lake associations yeah. are very adamant about their their groundwater. Yeah. You know, that's a really good point. We also have those farmer-led coalitions as well. And through that vehicle, they could apply for a grant. However, water quality isn't the largest, or highest priority in terms of being funded. So there's that piece. I know where that. With our farmer-led coalitions, they're more concerned about water quantity, particularly nowadays with you know high capacity wells than quality. So, but they'd be the applicant. And whether or not we get funded, it's, it's, it's a little more of a challenge. But somewhere definitely your department will keep on looking at it. Right. Build. Well, the Red Cedar Coalition in Dunn County got a ten thousand dollar grant to subsidize their groundwater study that's going on as well. But Joe, I believe Cedar Lake rehab has had yeah. some of these, haven't they? But that's just a piecemeal because yeah. I just want to share this with you. The St. Croix County project, just to give a sense of what a countywide groundwater study would cost. It's ranging again, this is five years. It's ranging between 56,000 to 72,000 a year for one staff person, and of course, for sampling costs. And it, that varies depending on the areas you're looking at. So, so that is the range of annual costs upwards to 76,000 to do a countywide. But there are counties twice as many people as ours, right? Yeah, I'm not sure. Well, but, but it is different. That's the point. And the question might be, our county is, is more spread out and more rural. So would there be more wells? Would it be a, a, a bigger expense or less? I, I don't know that. I think, uh, like he said, it, one of the basic costs of that is the full-time person. Yeah. Yeah. Population would have a lot to do with them. Well, the sampling is expensive. Convinced me to get mine tested, so I paid the hundred dollars to get mine tested, and then I did. Then I went online to the state websites to see where my numbers fell, and for nitrate levels, for example, my well tested the same as it did when we put it in twenty years ago, which was nice. But um, nitrate levels here are four percent in Polk County, but St. Croix County they're ten percent on the average wells that they've tested. You know, wells. For groundwater testing and we do really well compared to Dunn County and Chippewa County uh, because they're at 14 percent for nitrates so it's it's interesting to see how the different counties you know how it's different across the different counties I found this. a big variable is slope and soil type as well and yeah one site could test out completely different from one another. Yeah. So it really depends on that but it's expensive. I mean, it's a hundred dollars to get them tested, or thereabouts, per well. 
not the state data is a little outdated though, Sharon. I think some of the date the state data you're looking at is outdated though. I thought I looked at what when it was updated too. Uh, I didn't write that. Oh. Mm -hmm. I didn't write it down. Go ahead, Bob. Oh, I guess that's it. I mean, Dunn County did get a taking action with the year grant, and that's the public health. So that's $10,000 a year to subsidize those annual costs. So again, we put year grant search, cobble through grants together with the lake associations, with the farm led council, and with the public health grants to perhaps subsidize costs. But that, that, is, that is basically what we understand now. We were talking about public health impact on large scale agriculture. That's something where our lake, we have a lot of lake associations in our county. Um, most of us representatives do, are you together with yes. uh, Wapagas? No, I'm. I'm maybe, maybe, those, yeah. uh, maybe those don't even get funneled into the Deer County facility. Well, Wapagasset has like their own sanitary district, yes. like Pat Mustang Creek County in the population. It's a lot of higher population, but there's also a lot more people that are on municipal water and municipal, uh, you know, water services. Yeah. So, you know, here, you know, we have, we have city and village, you know, local utilities for a lot of folks, but there's a lot of folks that have their own. Well, I think that shows us that as a county, we're pretty well up on testing and dating, and we have a pretty good score. Well, yeah. since you said that about, you know, you mentioned that Farmington Township is high. Well, I've been asking around and stuff, and one guy had to go down another 150 feet because the nitrates were so high. Oh, wow. And then... They were saying that this one guy had a well drilled, and he's saying, why is the water so brown? And he was down over 100 feet, and he was in a wooded area. And it comes out, it's all the years that the oak leaves go way, way, way down. That was my next question, is that was just brought to my attention last week, is uh, uh, the fermentation of uh, it's always high along the river in Farmington and, and, and those river areas. And they just say from the fermentation over the years, you know, it all contributes to that. So uh, it's not just farmers or uh, lake people or anything else. It's that combination and fermentation in a wooded area has is a big factor. Something we can't do anything about. I think that's what we learned a lot through this whole CAFO discussion. You know, it's not only large scale agriculture, it's small producers, it's, it's human it's activities. part of the equation. Right. There's a lot of different um, inputs. Well, thanks for your information, Bob, and we'll. Uh... Wait, I have one last question. How did we pay for it in 80s or 96? How did that project get paid for? Oh, I, I don't know the answer to that question. I, mean, I was on the board, but I don't yeah, know that. I, I was just curious how yeah. we did it then. Obviously, the world is different now, so we have to decide. I, I, I believe it was part of the budget. Really? Yeah. I mean, you think about a positive outcome of the whole people dialogue. The idea, of, the idea of actually doing a groundwater study for the uh, general public, at least offer them that opportunity to understand whether or not they have nitrates or phosphorus in their water. Could be considered a good thing. It could align with what we've been talking about earlier with all of your policies, your ordinances, keeping in mind the impact on human health. You know, ahead of the problem. All right. Well, it's doing the study and then it's doing the what if. What if this happens? Yeah. What if this happens? What if they test that? Then what's next? Because we can't just do the study and then say to people, well, there you go. The short, term, <laughs> short term outcomes and people be aware. The quality of their water, that's a positive outcome. But then the need in the longer terms are what are the sources? You know, is there an old convenience store here? Or is there agricultural impacts, inputs, you know, leaching into the soil? How can we work with that producer to 
Did you have another question, Fran? Rather, well, just I, I just wanted to make a comment. Um, I think it's becoming more and more common that when people buy and sell homes, that a water test is part of it. Oh, sold that's mandatory. Yeah, I, yeah. Every time. I sold a home in the town of Lincoln <clears throat> about five years ago, and it came back um, with lead. And almost the sale almost fell through. Well, we had to drill holes in the walls, replace it. And the, the source of the lead was not the well, the groundwater. The source of the lead was from some piping that had been in the house when the house was built. So we had to tear walls out and replace pipes and test and retest and retest until all of that was cleared up. Part before of the equation. We could close on the sale of our house, and then you know you think, geez, you know my buyer is going to walk away because nobody they had little kids, you know nobody wants to buy a house with a, a lead problem in the water. But we were able to abate that, and everything was fine. But that's also another aspect of where the testing. Most of the done. drinking water in southern part of the county <laughs> has to have a, a reverse osmosis unit applied. Chris, you want to move on? Do you yeah, have a I just want to throw comment? one thing out as, as a contractor in the community is that, you know, it is very complicated. What Fran said is, do you test at the well or do you test past the well in the house? So, for example, there's a tourist rooming house in Polk County right now that the county has given them permission to operate a tourist rooming house. Uh, the new buyer found out through the water test that there's arsenic in the water. So county has allowed this tourist rooming house to operate. What liability does the county have in, in our rules to say, hey, we're gonna allow someone to operate a, a public facility? Well, the owners knew there was arsenic. The, pre, the owners that are selling the property, they said they mitigated it. Well, they didn't. You know, and, and that's where I go to as a contractor. Every well we drill is tested. Right, so we build, we drill a new well. It's tested. That that information should be back here, right? Than just at the DNR. Every farm is tested every year or two for their water qualities. Every year. Every year it is. And then this this fall, we have actually capped off uh, four separate wells. They were sand points on cabins we've torn down, old cabins. And again, you know. That would be a good reference to test before we cap a well. DNR requires us to hire a well driller to cap them properly. So they're capped. But another, just in my thoughts, is trying to figure out what our water quality is here. Why wouldn't there be requirements to say before you cap a well off, you do a test of the water, and then we drill the new well, we'll have that test. So I think there's a lot of testing already out there. It's just, is the information all getting back to the right people? And I'll just, just, I just wanted to tell you. Anytime you cap a well, another a lot of times there's even hand dug wells on the old farms and, and things, sand points and things like that. That has to be registered with the county. There's records and everything, isn't there, Bob? DNR has them. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Vince, we want to move on to, uh, we change that uh, uh, on our agenda there, we change the numbers a little bit. So do you want to address uh, D and B and uh, the veterans and the operations, ordinance, finding a fact? We can do it. Okay. Um, if you all recall, Malia sent that operational based ordinance by template from the town of Eureka in Bayfield to that cap on the DNR. Have you all got the response letter? I think we tried to get it back to you all. You want to address it, Bob? Sure, I'll just talk about the fine. And then it's in our minutes. Okay. Well, um, they reviewed the uh, oper operational base uh, ordinance. Um, they basically said there's some items within this ordinance that are not consistent with APCP 51, which is the administrative code that those two state agencies use into regulating large scale operations. Um, the big thing that at least I, I got out of this was that the law does not grant authority for any unit of government, the county, 
to disapprove a permit based on species. Okay, so in other words, we cannot regulate livestock facilities by just discriminating against them. Right. So swine, if you want to be species specific, if you want to just look at swine, then we have to prove that that species in some ways um, affects groundwater. So in other words, there you go back to the groundwater study. If there was some way to measure that swine operations or CAFOs that are swine uh, provide, produce, or add pathogens to the groundwater, then you can justify a species specific operational. And here is where, uh, Amy, uh, here, here's where. At one time, Malia spoke to us and said that part of that bayfield hadn't been tested in court. And so this is a result of what was tested in court. So that is the progress that has been made there. And that's why the Wisconsin counties took parts of the bayfield pilot program. And we just took parts of it in our uh, in the legislative process. Now the, uh, the ordinance that we set to fat cap, I don't know if they included Eureka's research or scientifically based studies or not. I believe it did. Okay, well, um, they're saying that they have to be local studies. So you can look at national trends or regional um, studies. They, they don't believe that that would support litigation. So it has to be a, a local Exactly. That has to be a so there's, uh, there's some minor things like small little edits. We need to define animal units. It did refer to the fact that we do have a manure water, water quality management ordinance. And no. So that exists. Land and Water administrates that. That could be put into the ordinance. The fee schedule they said was substantial. I think. We were suggesting that one dollar per swine unit per year, so that could be considered um, extreme. And they just basically invited us to um, consult corporate counsel. The same with the, um, the cost of abatement. Um, if there's any violators or violations of this ordinance, um, you know, um, it may not meet the state provisions. So they're asking us to again share with corporate counsel. And then Section 10 of the Operational Board Ordinance exceeds all their state standards. And so <coughs> we had a little concern about those state, those standards that were put in Section 10, particularly because some of them are really broad or ambiguous and uh, don't really specify which management practices the CAFO should incorporate or implement. So that just needs to be clarified a little bit. So there's, there's a lot of work to do. That cap's willing, willing to work with us, but you know what? They're, they're really advocating for the siding. The siding is the key. Yeah, we have three paths. We got the CUP, we got the operational based ordinance, or the siding law, which is really their, their, their administrative plan. So there's that. So, you know, that's why I kind of brought up boy, AB is related to AC because, again, if you wanted to explore whether or not um, an operational based ordinance um, specifically for swine should be pursued, then we need to do a local study to determine whether or not swine capos impact groundwater. So the question I have is, so there only responding to citing because that's their mm -hmm. wheelhouse yeah. and so we're really missing another whole piece of the universe here really that we could be um, taking advantage of I mean I read that letter as sort of a take-home uh, to help us craft things as not you know okay it's not exciting that we can do this then we do it in operations I mean I still go back to the operation pieces because we're leaving a third of the county out so however we get to that piece is important to keep trying to get to that piece to get to that coverage. Um, 
I, I would have fully expected that cap to say, oh, we like siting and siting is the way to go because that's their thing. So we're, but we're trying to look at an operation where it could be another operation siting piece. So that's their thing. So, so yeah, that's their, um, but we have this unique weirdness in our county where we have this gap of coverage under siting um, that doesn't cover us because they're not zoned. So it's, we still have this spot that we're in. Um, and so then, then the question I have back on the testing, but so to put together a findings of fact that is locally based, um, scientifically defensible, is exceedingly onerous. I mean, it's ridiculous. And it, it really is, um, it, it, it completely ties the hands of local officials to do any sort of protection of our communities because, well, sorry, you gotta have a $50,000 groundwater study to prove that, I, I just find it hard to believe that we can't say pigs manure operates this way in this kind of soil, whether it's in Iowa, North Carolina, or Wisconsin, and that that's not going to be defensible. I find that hard to believe. I, I mean, I, I don't really want to take this and say, oh, yeah, okay, we got to do a bunch of studies because we shouldn't have to put that bill. Um, the taxpayers shouldn't, and, and the county shouldn't. And the part of that was, you know, the, the local uh, impact, and we really don't have local right. things to study. Right. Right, and it's super expensive to get at. And, well, and we hope we don't. But we 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 have to still have some protective measures in place so that we don't get to that point. Um, well, thank Bob. I think that uh, pretty much covers that part of it. That so if we took down some notes, uh, we got something to do. Yeah, one last question. Are we going to get friends? Can I just a quick question? Um, is there any way it to coordinate and compile the <coughs> well data that is available either through the DNR or home sales or whatever? Is there any way to coordinate that into kind of one informational piece for Polk County to give us some type of snapshot or picture of what is out there? Because 1996 was a long time ago. Right. And if there is existing information, and there's some way to pull that together, that may be beneficial in kind of a, a, a snapshot, maybe, of where things are at. Maybe I don't the know DNR what that might would have entail something. or anything, but just, just wondering. Uh, UW Stevens Point of the Center for uh, Groundwater Education, I think I sent this to some of you. They have data, county based data. Extension does. Yeah, they're part of a UW extension system, so they have some uh, water quality specialists as well. Um, you know, the 96 groundwater data, personally, I don't think has a lot of value because it's so old. Balsam Lake study from last year is very valid. So that's something, that's a different approach. We could look at it on a watershed basis. Look at areas where, where soils are, you know, susceptible. That's a terrific resource. Mm -hmm. Well, we could we could approach it that way. And, uh, so we would just need guidance which which water sites you want to pursue. We know where large scale agriculture is. We also know where urban areas are. We also know other human activities. Thanks a lot for your research and, mm -hmm. and your time and effort. To, uh, to help us along that. Uh, Vince, do you want to cover the... Uh, One question, John. Uh, Amy, your comment on <clears throat> different regulations for for TAFOs and stuff, you know, like hogs, and to me, I don't think you can do that because to me, that would be like discrimination because you've got... Then you're going to have to say, okay, turkey, um, pigs, cattle, um, Chickens. You mean swine only? Uh, swine only. Right? But you know, but if you do that, then you're you're singling out one that, thing. That's really what Bob covered. It had it had to be local situation. And when he started out, the swine couldn't be identified. Right. 
Benji, let's move on to then uh, number yeah. D, that comment. He is the veterans up there. Andy right. Muskler is our director of the veterans services. Office. Here we are. <laughs> Always happy to see him. <laughs> Draw that way. I did it with my foot earlier. <laughs> Good morning. So Good morning. things are going great down in the veterans service office. Uh, surprisingly, even with COVID-19, we've been keeping busy as usual. A lot of our numbers in comparing to last year, we've, we've already exceeded as far as claims committed to the VA, and we're on trend to exceed um, other numbers as well. One of the things I did early on when COVID-19 came you know, to Polk County and we had changes within working remotely and whatnot is I implemented a, a new software which allowed me to get digital and electronic signatures from veterans. So trying to limit that face-to-face -face contact and appointments, just coming up with an alternative that way. Veterans can view the forms online, whether it's their smartphone or computer, they can sign electronically. Also with me being an, an accredited representative, that gives me the ability to sign on veterans' behalf. So as far as claim work and things like that, I can just have a standard telephone appointment, sign on their behalf, and send what's needed to the team. Boy, that's awesome. Absolutely. So things are going good. Um, currently right now, we have one person. Well, our department, we only have two people, so myself and Gail Wasford. She's the benefit specialist, so we have one person in the office Monday through Friday. Otherwise... Say, for example, I'm here to deal So you can take all 24, uh, what, what's your hours there? Yeah, so Monday through Friday, 8.30 to 4.30. Of course, I'm available, you know, as needed in the evenings or weekends. We've had situations, you know, knock on wood. Yeah, you are no bring 24 7. Yeah, no veteran suicides in Polk County since COVID-19 has started. We've had a few close calls, you know, where I've had to, you know, I get calls on the weekend notification as yeah. far as someone struggling and whatnot. Transportation's so, going okay. For the ADRC, so with our transportation program for the veterans in Polk County, the Aging and Disability Resource Center, they have their volunteer drivers program. So they are the ones who transport veterans to their VA medical appointments. Early on, when COVID first came, of course, everything closed down. So VA really limited their appointments. So we did see a decrease with those transportation miles and they're slowly starting to get, go back up. Now, I don't know what's going to happen with the COVID situation in the Midwest as far as if the VA is going to go back to reducing those appointments. Um, so I guess time will tell on that. You have enough of those volunteer drivers? No. ADRC is always looking That's for volunteer good. drivers. That's a comment I wanted to see that we need more transportation drivers. And are they compensated in any way? Uh, they get a mileage and then I, I believe their meals are paid for. I don't know what the mileage rate is for that driver. The bed rate, whatever the bed rate okay. is. Yeah, it's like that. Yep. Well, hopefully something can come out of this comment at the meeting today. Yeah, absolutely. I know they're promoting it on their Facebook page. I've shared it on our department Facebook page. Um, Any way that we can help, you know, as our committee, we'll take that responsibility. Yeah, absolutely. Just spread the word that volunteer drivers are needed. The yeah. uh, comment on that, too, is we're waiting to see how much extra money ADRC has in their transportation fund and stuff, because what we're trying to do is buy a van, a handicapped van, to transport some of these veterans back and forth because you don't want to take the big vehicle down to the cities for one person. So they want to see what they got. Vince is supposed to get back. And hopefully we can get a van for ADRC with a driver and stuff. And currently they have, um, they're promoting for drivers and hopefully they can get more drivers and some of them can actually be used for 
not just taking the veterans and people don't. So when is your meeting for monthly? We don't, we go every two months. The next one is uh, next this December. December. But uh, that's what they're trying to do now is to work more with the veterans. Where do you have your meeting then? Here. Okay, well, no, it's between here, um, the tribe, which we don't know if they're going to do it anymore. They have not been being representative, and the last one was supposed to be there, but then we had it at uh, Burnett. But it's the three three different places. So well, thanks for your service on the uh, ADRC board. Yeah, but that's what they're trying to do is to get it so that it would help the veterans more. Any too. other questions for our uh, veteran officer? Go ahead, Bill. Well, Veterans Day. Brad, oh, thank you for your service. Oh, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. What branch were you in? What's that? Yeah. What branch was I in? Yeah. I was in the Army. Totally. <laughs> okay, well, thanks again. And uh, so let's go to items for the next meeting December 8th. I have uh, a couple ideas. Um, yeah, take care. So in keeping with this groundwater conversation, I have a uh, retired DNR. I'm hoping we can get this guy to talk about this 2019 nitrate study. If people would be interested in that, I think it would be good to just kind of have you a- You can get somebody to give us some info on that. Okay, so I'll see if I can work on that. Then I, um, I want to give an update myself on the Wisconsin Counties Association opinions on the fees, bonds, and felony discussion. And then, um, I think we should have findings of fact in the operation ordinance as a standing item. I don't know if we need to continue that all the time. If you mentioned that fees bond, I'd happen to remember that. That is a big controversial. Uh, a lot of things on both sides. Right. Well, that we now have Wisconsin Counties Association has given an opinion on that. So that's helpful. That'll help us. Um, and then just to put in the back of your mind, the later, maybe January ish, we could do it. I, I got a call from one of the people who live in my district who works for the Department of Ag in Minnesota and was willing to talk to us about their countywide, they work with counties around their whole state on these this kind of exact testing and she develops and manages the program and I said, would you give us 10 minutes of your time and explain it to us? So if we're interested, we could do that maybe in January. I'm open to whatever contribution. You'll meet in January. Okay, February. February. We don't meet January? Okay. No. I, I just have a question. Um, how would we go about, or would it need to be an agenda item, or, or how would we accomplish research on how to tie all of this existing well information together? What do we have to do to I make I think the lead organization in that is the DNR bits, right? Well, I think. Uh, I think a, a committee could could propose to the board that we do. I mean, if you're asking for a study, I think we could work with. I'll work with Bob and see what that's going to take. Yeah, I, yeah. I think, just what it would take. You know, I I don't know if it would be an overwhelming, cumbersome project or if it's fairly easy. I would have no yeah, idea whatsoever. I, but I'd like to find out what it would entail. That's what I'll find out. Yeah, I think we can get started. What we're trying to do is get these agenda items in. And our, Tanya, you'll be doing most of the agenda for the uh, month of December. I'll be here in December and then I'll be done in January. I'll be doing in February. No, that, that was my mistake. We don't meet in February. Yeah, our meeting was canceled in January last year. Yeah, yeah last January. year was just a reversal. Right. Because of the new administration and things like that. So, yeah. I'll work with Tanya on the name last, and see if that person can come. Last year was the first time I remember we actually had a county board meeting in February. Normally, February, yeah. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Uh, move to adjourn. Second. Supervisor Bill, Supervisor. And so all in favor say aye. 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 It's carried. Thanks, everybody, and uh, happy Veterans Day. Happy Thanksgiving happy Day. Happy Veterans Day to you, Joe. Mm -hmm. you, you, Joe. You, <laughs> happy Veterans Day to you, Joe. Anybody else?
I'm here. I know this. Are you a veteran? No, I'm not. Well, anybody in here who is. I think he said he wasn't either. I have a whole family of them. Yeah. <laughs> my daughter, 20 years in the Marine Corps. Personally, mine are all military.